Hey everyone, uh, Naman here. Excited to talk to you all about uh, WebAssembly, which as the title says, uh, is redefining the capabilities of the web. So while uh, we could cover a lot of breadth as well as depth on this topic, I would be given the limited time, I would be covering uh, the breadth, uh, but you will see that there are links throughout the slides, uh, which you can use to explore in uh, the depth part of it. Uh, and I will be sharing the link to the slides at the end of the talk. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Also, uh, before we start, a uh, couple of disclaimers. So one of them being the talk is in my personal capacity, uh, which means uh, it does not represent the views or opinions of my employers. Uh, and I'll only be like taking questions uh, uh, pertaining to the topic. The second one being, uh, I do not consider myself an expert on WebAssembly. The reason being, I don't have a significant hands-on experience. Having said that, I have explored a fair bit and uh, the idea is to share my learning and get you to explore it for your use cases. Cool, so here's the outline for the talk. So we'll start with the needs for WebAssembly, uh, the origin, uh, and then look at what it is, uh, followed by use cases as well as real world usages. And uh, we finish off with uh, how do you go about integrating it with vanilla JavaScript or React? Uh, and some of the developer tools, libraries that are available, and uh, the roadmap uh, for web assembly. So this is what the first web page, uh, which was created by Sir Tim Berners-Lee all the way back in 1991 looked like. So you can see it's just text with some links thrown in there. And you know that's uh, as simple as how the web started. And since then, uh, we've had tremendous evolution. So this is like a shortened version of the evolution of the web. And uh, even though like I have the years back by references, they might be slightly off, uh, but the point is more on uh, the kind of evolution we have had. Uh, so we had the, you know, JavaScript come along in 1995, uh, then came CSS, uh, and then, you know, we kept doing our pages that way until uh, in 2005 or so, we had uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML come along, uh, which was a very new way of doing uh, things on the web. Uh, we had an explosion of libraries uh, and jQuery was uh, the most notable one. Then in 2010, we had AngularJS with its two-way data binding. Uh, and then in 2013, we had React with its virtual DOM approach. Uh, and then in 2016, we had Svelte with a build time uh, optimization based approach. And you know who knows what's next. So all that uh, is, uh, all this tremendous evolution, uh, the reason it's happened is uh, because of the nature of the web. So uh, we can see that, uh, you know, shareability. So, uh, you know, it's a link based access. So all I need to do is enter a link from any device uh, and I can universally just access uh, my application. Also, it's ephemeral, meaning I don't need to do any installs. So, uh, so that's great. And and even versioning is uh, either not there or it's very limited. So those are you know some things which have led to the tremendous uh, uh, you know investment on the web. So then, why do we need WebAssembly, right? So quoting Felipe, uh, who is the project lead at W3C. So W3C is Worldwide Web Consortium. And he says, in a world where machine learning and AI become more and more common, it is important to enable high performance applications on the web without compromising the safety of the users. So what he's hinting to is, A, uh, we have bottlenecks in optimizing a dynamic language like JavaScript. So uh, you know, even though engines like V8 have done a great job at it, uh, just because of the nature of it, so let's say you have a simple uh, plus operator. There are multiple, you know, operands that you could have, and uh, you know, figuring out the one that is applicable consumes multiple CPU instructions, which is non-optimal. Uh, also, there is this inability to leverage improved hardware when you are having uh, an application on the web. So, what do we mean by that? So, even though we have, uh, you know, web workers and we're able to create threads, uh, there are two major drawbacks with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, this sort of uh, refers to the fact that even our smartphones, uh, so many of them tend to have six to eight cores, right? 
and uh, unfortunately we're not able to leverage it so the reason is uh, every time you spawn a new web worker it creates a new instance of the v8 engine uh, which is called an isolate and uh, you know so thereby if you keep creating more and more workers eventually you'll run into memory issues uh, so that's one the other one is uh, there is no shared memory between the web workers so the only way you can communicate is through passing messages which is a you know costly operation so it's not true parallelism uh, in that sense uh, and the other one is there are these hardware optimization techniques so for example simd which we look at so that is called uh, that stands for single instruction multiple data uh, so that's something that's used in the world of you know image processing and games and uh, those things are just not there at the moment uh, you know on the web uh, apart from this uh, you know even the javascript is very flexible and we have been able to make it work for you know a lot of these use cases uh, but it was never designed uh, for these in the first place and uh, you know thereby it's sort of not optimal for these uh, and also we are having support for only uh, you know this single language uh, on the web uh, so yeah so that's something and and also we're not able to leverage you know uh, there's a huge amount of uh, libraries written in c c++ and other languages which are very mature and you know uh, we are just not able to use them on the web so that's again a limitation at the moment so that's where uh, trendy comes in and you know uh, before we get into it uh, if you think about it there have been attempts in the past so there was java applets which was a jvm based uh, you know approach of running it on the web there was adobe flash uh, but these both had uh, you know Uh, multiple limitations so one of them was they were never part of the web platforms they were never standardized uh, they had no native api integration so you know even visually they were just something different uh, that used to run on the web you had to install a plugin to be able to run it uh, so they were isolated from the rest of the web which is why they never took off uh, and on top of that there were major security vulnerabilities so for example flash even got banned from ios and you know they were coupled to a single language and they were backed by a corporate uh, which meant that they never had support across browsers so yeah so we will see uh, you know webassembly is uh, doing all of these uh, which but uh, different so apart from this they have been a uh, native client and portable native client from google so that is a way to compile your existing c c++ uh, from the web uh, into uh, you know like a, a subset of javascript and this sort of converted uh, uh, into something as asm js by mozilla so asm is stands for assembly and uh, the idea here is there is this m script uh, compiler which is a drop in replacement for your c any c compiler so let's say gcc and uh, what it does is uh, you know it will enable you to do this uh, conversion into asmjs and uh, because c program might use file like you might have file handling uh, you might have opengl usage so it just takes care of all of that uh, yeah and so so with all this uh, context uh, there was a working group formed in w3c and interestingly brendan ike uh, the creator of javascript himself uh, in back in 2015 he sort of posted about this so uh, you know how from asmjs we went to webassembly and uh, that's where a pivotal moment in uh, the the you know evolution of the web is where uh, all the major browser uh, you know vendors so google apple microsoft and mozilla they all got together to uh, create a mvp version of webassembly so mvp is minimum viable product and yeah so that was a landmark moment cool so i guess enough uh, you know context uh, uh, or enough build up so what is webassembly so it's a low level assembly like language with a compact binary format so what does that mean so low level meaning it is closer to your machine code so it's essentially a byte code uh and uh, it is an assembly like language so uh, you know uh, that makes it more performant and uh, it's compact 
So it's it's if you compare the size to let's say a compressed JavaScript, it's going to be uh, lesser. So there is a what format, the .wat, which is a textual representation, which is your assembly-like uh, you know representation, and then there is a vasm, which is a binary representation. And the text one is uh, s expression based. So s expression is symbolic expression. Uh, it's uh, it's like a way to represent a nested list. Uh, so yeah, so what WebAssembly enables is running a running languages other than JavaScript on the web. So it's a compilation target. Uh, so while you could by hand write WebAssembly like the textual form and compile it to Wasm, uh, that's not the intended usage. Uh, so yeah, it's supposed to be a compilation target, and it enables near native performance as well as more consistent performance as compared to JavaScript. Uh, and it's also a standard uh, in WCC, so it became a standard. So in terms of languages, uh, you know, currently uh, languages like C, C++, and Rust, uh, which do not have, uh, you know, garbage collection, so they are manual uh, memory management based. So those are the ones uh, which have, you know, which work the best right, at the moment. There's also uh, Okay, before I get to assembly skip, so by the way, Rust is also the most loved language uh, as per Stack Overflow survey for last year. Uh, so now it's great that we're able to you know, use it for the web. Uh, there's also assembly script, uh, because if you're thinking uh, as a web developer, I need to learn these new languages. Uh, so there's also assembly script, which is closer to TypeScript, uh, almost like TypeScript with a few differences. Uh, but quoting from the MDN docs, it has sl slower performance at the moment as compared to when using Rust or C++. And there are other languages like Golang, uh, .NET Core, and a bunch of them. Uh, so yeah, so you could take a look uh, to look at the other languages. So you must be thinking, uh, so does it mean this is the end of JavaScript? So uh, you know, uh, that's like uh, what is there in like most people's mind. So uh, I guess most of us would be, you know, uh, happy to know this that uh, that is not the case. Uh, uh, but if yeah, some of some folks were hoping that okay, JS is going away. Uh, that's not happening. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, rather than WebAssembly being a replacement for JavaScript, it is actually designed to be a complement to JavaScript. Uh, and this is not me saying it. This is you know uh, from the official docs. Uh, so that's one of the design goals uh, for WebAssembly. Uh, yeah, so so that's there. So what about browser support? So it supported ninety-two percent uh, of all browsers, uh, which is great. Uh, but yeah, there are browsers like i eleven and Opera Mini and so on. Uh, but yeah, what about security? So, uh, you know, again, quoting from the docs, uh, WebAssembly's MVP will be no loser from a security point of view than if the module was JavaScript. So, what that means is uh, all of these security, uh, you know, checks or constraints that apply to JS apply to WebAssembly as well. Uh, and so, so, things like sandboxing, same origin policy, cross origin uh, resource sharing, uh, sub resource integrity, and so on. And it's also one of the high-level goals uh, for WebAssembly in terms of security. So what about use cases? So uh, if you need high performance, so let's say uh, taking an example of TensorFlow, uh, which is Google's machine learning-based uh, you know, library. So they have created a WebAssembly backend, uh, as they say, in, in, uh, for some of their models. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, as they have sort of talked about it on their blog, uh, they have seen a 10x improvement uh, in speed uh, for, for some of these models. So they are taking, uh, adding more support, uh, like adding support for more models as well. Game engines. So Unity and Unreal are two of the most popular uh, game engines uh, now support compiling to Wasm. So you can target your game as uh, for running it on the web. Uh, porting legacy code bases. So Qt, uh, which is, let me just show you here. So, so if you can see, so this is a graphical uh, widget toolkit, which was very popular. Uh, I mean, it's, it's popular for C, C++ applications. So now you can just take it and run it uh, on the web. So, so that's great. Uh, uh, 
ஆப்சோலிசிபிளி so yeah so that's uh, one use case you could also leverage mature libraries so for example ebay so they have a stellar application which uh, needs to have a barcode scanner and on the mobile app side they have a in house c++ library which does that so they just integrated it into their native ios and android apps but when it comes to mobile web uh, they have had trouble uh, so they they try to to use like a javascript library which didn't work out it only worked well in 20% of the cases uh, so then what they have done is they've been able to take the c++ uh, library and compile it to web assembly and then just use that for mobile web and that has led to increased convergence for them so yeah so that's uh, again a uh, use case for web assembly and even though it was designed with the web in mind uh, interestingly it has uh you know picked up even outside the web so uh so if you think about it this problem of running uh, you know untrusted code in a secure and performant manner it's not uh you know applicable just to the web so uh you know so outside the web uh, you need web assembly to be able to uh, hook into the system calls so that's why there's something called web assembly system interface which is wasi and uh, using this uh taking an example of cloudflare so cloudflare works in the edge computing space and what they have done is they have these workers as they call them which are based on the serverless idea and till now they had only support for javascript so what they did is they added support for web assembly on their workers and now one they have support for multiple languages and two they have seen performance improvements so yeah so that's again uh, an interesting use case and talking about uh, while we t- look, took a look at few real world usages uh, here are like some more interesting ones so uh, in my opinion autocad is the most uh, you know beautiful one so autocad is a computer aided design tool which is uh, very popular uh, built by autodesk and uh, you know it was written all the way back in 1982 which is you know before the web was even uh, you know there uh, and the beauty of web assembly is that uh, they have been able to take that code and run it on the web right now so if you go to web.autocad.com you can pretty much do the same thing as your uh, you know uh, the autocad uh, with all of the features so they have done attempts in the past where they used flash to get it on the web uh, but that didn't work uh, because they had limited features and as i said flash had you know the issues i called out earlier Uh, they even did a html5 approach but they had to rewrite some of the code and every time they added a new feature they have to rewrite it, like replicate that effort for the web which doesn't scale so that's why it never uh, picked up google earth so google earth uh, uses uh, one of the features of web assembly which is right now behind a flag chrome flag which is threads so i guess i'll cover this in more detail later so i'll skip that for now Uh, but yeah google earth is one of the first users of thread support in web assembly uh doom 3 yeah so this is an interesting one so you can see right now i'm able to play uh, the doom 3 game it's a demo version uh, but this is you can see it's running at almost 60 fps uh, and i'm able to just simply you know use a link to play it on the web uh, which is uh, very nice there's also zoom the popular video uh sharing app- video calling application so they have collaborated uh with google uh, so they were featured at web dev live where they're using web assembly for uh, or they're exploring web assembly usage for their custom background feature uh, and they also have their web sdk where uh, they use web assembly uh, yeah and lastly there's fastly so fastly is again from the edge computing space and this is an outside the web use case so they have built their own runtime and compiler for web assembly uh, which they call lucet and uh, yeah that has worked well for them 
So there are more. Uh, there's a site called madewithwebassembly.com. Uh, so you could look at some of the other projects. So how do you go about integrating this? So in the vanilla JavaScript world, let me you know come back to the previous one and start with this. So if you see at the very top, uh, we have. Uh, so what we're going to be seeing is how do you do the interop from JS to WebAssembly and WebAssembly back to JS, right? Uh, so we have uh, uh, an imported func, which is a JS function, which simply takes an argument and logs it to the console. And uh, what we'll be doing is uh, we will be calling this function from WebAssembly, passing it an argument, and that is what will get logged. So uh, yeah, so so how do you instantiate a WebAssembly object, right? So uh, there are two methods at the moment. Uh, so the one you see uh, on in, in the middle, uh, right? So that is the preferred one. Uh, reason being, what you can do is a it's streaming based. So if you see the the previous approach, the one at the bottom. So you need to fetch the WebAssembly bytecode and then uh, you can start you know processing it. Whereas uh, with streaming, you need not be you know wait uh, waiting on it uh, and the second one is uh, uh, you can see that in the uh, bottom one the older approach you need to convert it first in array buffer before you can instantiate it but uh, you really don't need to do that now because you can directly instantiate it uh, yeah so what this does is it is instantiating this and then it is calling the exported func so exported func is defined here in the WebAssembly code so what you see here is the what format, the textual form, uh, and you can see that there are types. And I'm importing the JavaScript function called imported func, and you know I'm having the exported func, which is defined in WebAssembly, which says that I want to have a 32-bit integer, uh, which is having the value 42, and then I call it, uh, uh, I call the JavaScript function, and yeah, so so that's it for this. So what about React world, right? Uh, so uh, let me just go to uh, this online uh, tool called WebAssembly Studio. So it's a way to, uh, you know, on the without having to do local setup, you can compile your code to WebAssembly. So it asked me to pick a language. I'll go ahead with WebAssembly script and I will say create project. So it should be done. Okay, I guess uh, I'm not sure why it's having trouble. Okay, it's done. Yeah, so you can see I can go here and let me just remove this. So you can see I have a simple add function here which takes two arguments of types 32-bit uh, integers, returning a 32-bit integer as well. And yeah, so that's very close to your TypeScript code. And uh, you can save this and build and run this. So what, once you do that, it will, uh, it will okay. I, I see there's some error here. Uh, just a second. Okay, it seems to be. I'm not sure why it's failing to fetch this. But yeah, once you build and run, you will see a out generated wasm file here. So what I have, yeah, so so this is like what I have out here in my uh, VS Code. And uh, the way you can use this is uh, so there are multiple approaches, but the uh, one I would recommend is uh, so there is this package called uh, React Basm, uh, which is uh, written by uh, Matthew Basso. So uh, what it lets you do is there are three ways you can do this. So you can use a hook based approach, a render prop based approach, or a higher order component based approach. So right now I have uh, the one which is uh, with the hook. So let me just run this uh, locally. And let me just open my dev tools. Yeah, so you can see it uh, printed the sum and I have this wasm file loaded which has the mime type as application wasm. So yeah, so that's uh, basically how you load it. Now let's look at the code. So let's look at the hook base approach first. So there's this use wasm hook and you pass it this URL from your, uh, like the file you have in the public directory. And yeah, once it's loaded, you get an instance and that will have your exported method. So we have the add method and I can just pass it off in. Uh, similarly, I can do a render prop based approach 
or I can do a higher order component based approach. So I can just say with Wasm and pass my component and yeah, so that's how you could do it. So uh, yeah, so that's, uh, and yeah, I do have this also uh, in this uh, repo on my GitHub uh, in case you want to look at the code. So what about developer tool? So there's a web backdoor. There's a Wasm feature detect, which is provided to Google Chrome team itself, uh, which is for some of the newer Wasm features. Uh, so you could use that for feature detection. There's Wasm pack for support for Rust. There's uh, the same person, Matthew Bass, who also has a library for uh, running this WebAssembly instantiation in a worker thread. So right now we were doing it on a main thread. Uh, so that's that. There's also a VS Code extension. So if you see here, uh, if I go to a Wasm file, I can say show WebAssembly. And yeah, so uh, that's what you get from the VS Code extension. And then there's a Chrome extension called WAF, which is which was featured in last year's Chrome Dev Summit. Uh, so that adds debugging support in your dev tools in, in Chrome. So what about the roadmap? So as I said, there is uh, threads. So uh, you know, a lot of the C code and even other languages they use these key threads or POSIX threads, and those programs are not able to run on the web. Uh, so with thread support, uh, we're able to do this. And how is this different from workers? So uh, these have a shared memory. So, uh, you know, they have like a shared array buffer. And uh, so that solves one of the issues I called out. And, uh, uh, you know, the other issue is that uh, they don't have like a, each thread, each thread won't create like a new instance of your engine, uh, your JS engine. So, so that's good. Same day I, I already talked about integration with ES6 module system. So this is, uh, you know, going to be, it, it's going to be the case soon that you can just import a WebAssembly module, just how you do it for a JavaScript module. So there's no difference. Uh, so you just import it and you can just use it. So that should make things simpler. There's also tail call optimization. So this is for functional programming languages like Haskell. So uh, soon we will have support for writing those and then compiling it to Wasm. And garbage collection. So this is very interesting. Uh, so once this goes through, uh, we will have support for, so right now, if you have to do any DOM-based operation or web API access, you have to go through JavaScript. Uh, but yeah, once we have this uh, proposal go through, we will We'll be able to do direct uh, DOM and VPI access. Uh, so yeah, so that's going to be interesting. And also with this, we can have support for languages like Kotlin, Java, and and so on. So uh, these are some of the references I would recommend. So the official docs, the MDN docs, uh, Lynn Clark, uh, who uh, works at Mozilla and has some of the best uh, you know content around WebAssembly. So. She gave a talk in JSCon for you, uh, which is, I think, a great intro talk. Uh, there are talks in uh, Google I.O. and Chrome Dev Summit for you know uh, every year for the last five years. Uh, but the ones I would recommend is uh, the Google I.O. 18 and 19. So they introduce WebAssembly. And uh, Chrome Dev Summit 18 is talks about threads. And uh, the debugging one I, I talked about, so that was from last year. Uh, so you have good debugging support now in DevTools. Uh, there's also this very uh, detailed uh, write-up by uh, Rasmus Anderson, who works at Stigma. Uh, so that gets into a lot of the low-level details. Uh, there's also an interview with Brendan Eich uh, on WebAssembly, which is very interesting. And finally, there's Awesome Wasm, which is a very comprehensive uh, you know, uh, repo for anything related to Wasm. So yeah, that's all folks. Uh, you can access these slides at bit.ly forward slash uh, react a hyphen WebAssembly, I mean, wa hyphen naman. Uh, uh, and that's my Twitter handle. And uh, you can find me on the web here. I will be uh, you know, available in these sessions uh, tabs. So, so if you have any questions, uh, yeah, uh, happy to uh, chat. So yeah, thank you.